Hi, everyone. Today, I am interviewing uh, Barbara Carapa, SEPM's 2022 winner of the William R. Dickinson Award for recognition of a mid-career geoscientist who is significantly influencing the sedimentary geology community with innovative work. My name is Ellen Reed Worsan. I'm a recent PhD graduate of the University of Utah, and I am a sedimentologist and a geochronologist in the energy industry. And I'm really excited to interview Barbara today because I've been a fan of her work for a long time. Um, so yeah, so we can jump right in with the first question. Um, so Barbara, in five minutes or less, could you summarize your path to the geosciences? Yeah, so I started off, I'm originally Italian, and that's where I got my undergraduate degree. Um, I did my master, uh, my undergraduate and master in uh, Italy at the University of Pavia, uh, which is in Northern Italy. And then I moved to the Netherlands, uh, to Amsterdam to do my PhD. And then I moved to uh, the University of Potsdam in Germany, where I did my postdoc. And then eventually I moved to the U.S. Uh, for my first academic job as assistant professor at the University of Wyoming, where I stayed for three years before moving to the University of Arizona, where I'm currently at. How did you get excited about geosciences in undergraduate? Yeah, I have always been excited about science. And uh, in Italy, you know, it's different than in the US. You don't actually get to start and then pick your major. You sort of have to go in knowing what you want to do, which is a little bit of a, there are plus and minuses to it. So I actually picked geosciences before going into, um, into college. And the reason being, I was interested in, again, uh, science applied to overall earth. Uh, I really had a very poor understanding of what geosciences is all about, <laughs> like a lot of our students. Um, but I was lucky enough to find it very exciting, and and I I, I was lucky to just find passion in, in geosciences, um, and so that's how I kind of started, and that's what led me to the position I have right now. Awesome. Um, okay, so our next question: What would you say you are most proud of? in your career? Uh, I would say taking opportunities even though they presented themselves with challenges like leaving my country when I had to go to do a PhD in Amsterdam was exciting but also kind of frightening at the same time. Uh, the same when I left Amsterdam to go to Germany and then leaving to go to the US so I felt like those were all great opportunities but they came with you know prices to pay, leaving family, friends behind, culture that you know. But at the same time, they also provided me with a great opportunity to learn new cultures and, and, and really kind of broaden my, not just education, but, but also understanding of, of other, you know, living in different places, which I think has been a unique experience for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that kind of leads into this question um, that we have here about challenges and setbacks. And so I'm wondering if you could talk about some times where you face challenges or setbacks um, that turned out to be valuable experiences, I guess, other than the ones you've just named, right? You know, how has that experience of taking something that's a challenge um, and going forward with it anyways, um, shown up in your career now, since you've been at Arizona for a while now, right? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, I mean, I guess the, main, the major one that I still remember very vividly, and, and it just helps me now really connect with international students, I would say more than maybe if, if I were not an international scholar, is that when I moved to Amsterdam, my English was very poor. You know, you just study English in school, but you don't really know how to speak it or communicate. And so I was, for the first, I will say, year at least, um, I would just be completely overwhelmed by just trying to stay alive, <laughs> figuring out what was going on, let alone learn anything about geosciences. So that, that is very still very much in my mind. So I, I do really connect with, I understand the challenges that international students have when they come, they go to a different country and they have to communicate in different languages, take classes in different languages and so forth. Um, at the same time, that gives you an extra level of, of maybe resilience, you know, and then you become 
comfortable being uncomfortable. I think that's probably my best uh, way to describe what those challenges have given me. Um, and then another one that I want, and that is that is one thing. The other one that I wanted to sort of uh, bring up that was much later in my career when I was already an assistant professor was sort of an episode of, I would call it now that I recognize it, uh, bullism by one of my colleagues, senior, more senior colleague, not in the department. Um, that sort of made, put me in a, in a lower position, just kind of, it was disrespectful in the way that, that this person treated me and I didn't recognize it at first, but I, I was lucky enough to recognize it soon enough to just stand up and basically just stand up for myself even though i was in a again i was an assistant professor and i i was worried that that would have implications because this person is very much um you know it's it's a it, well known in in the community um and that again that taught me the power of again just believing in yourself standing up for yourself no matter where you are in your career because that's very important and it just kind of then gives you an extra level of confidence moving forward. So I think those will be the, the major setbacks, but at the same time, things that have really taught me a lot and have been valuable experiences. Great, great, thank you. Um, if you could go back in time, would you change anything that you did? Would you do anything differently? You know, to be honest, no. I was thinking about that and I just feel like I was very lucky to have had the opportunities I had to grow up where I grew up, to have, to have been able to go to college where I went to college. Um, so I, I know I wouldn't change anything. That's awesome. I, I don't think very many people can say that. <laughs> no. Yeah. Um, what advice would you give young professionals in academia or not in academia, just starting out their career like me? I'm a this is my first year in my career now, um, postgraduate school. Uh, enjoy what you do. Try to, uh, you know, do things you like to do. You know, I think that one of the unique things we have in academia and with our job is to really, is independence, right? To, to do what you want to do in terms of science. You, you choose your science, you choose what you want to do and where you want to go. Just have fun with it and not and don't be afraid to think outside the box. You know, many times I've come across people still to this day where like I'm very excited about an idea and they just tell me, oh, who cares? Right. Which is a good question to ask. Um, and sometimes, though, it's more like I appreciate that and I definitely have to defend that. But at the same time, it's like, well, I think it's very cool and I don't really care if you don't care. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I think there is like a you know, a balance that you need to find at some point that comes with, I think, experience and age, uh, but uh, don't don't feel um, afraid to just go your way when you're passionate about something that you think it's exciting. Awesome. Okay, so the next set of questions is a little bit more about um, your work-life balance and sort of your day-to-day -day job and, and life. So, um, how would you say that you manage your time and maintain a work-life balance? I try to exercise on a daily basis because I think it's really important to do something outside of the office. I usually do early in the morning before I get into the office so that I just have, um, I'm ready for the day. Um, so, and, and then I have a, a passion that is horseback riding. So I have a horse and I spend a lot of time with my horse and that is my safe space <laughs> and so i'm very lucky and i i'm very um organized in terms of like making sure that i have a schedule that allows me to spend enough time outside of the office doing the things i love to do uh, which is not just work um, and so i think that that's really important everybody needs to really and sometimes that's work you know it requires discipline because you get so busy sometimes that you just it's easier to just that i'm sure everybody can relate to this you know especially during covid you get up you dress up and you are on your computer right and then 9 p.m you're still on your computer it's just not yeah it's not a healthy way to go so you really have to push yourself to just do other things outside and that's what i've been um I've been doing more, I would say, in the last 10 years than earlier on, you know, when I was a PhD, definitely I can't say that I had a balance. There was no balance whatsoever. I was in the lab all the time and 
working most of the time. And then as I went through tenure, uh, again, there's so much pressure that I, that was difficult. But I made uh, a point when I became eventually tenure, when I got tenure to sort of save time for my personal you know, life outside of the office. So you kind of mentioned it there, but the discipline to build that time into your week, you know, do you think that that also makes you better at your job? Yes, it makes you more efficient, I think, when you have a certain amount of time to do a certain task versus unlimited amount of time. I've noticed that now, since I'm, I've been department head for now four years, this is my fifth year, and so I've been very busy with other things outside of just the normal, you know, science and teaching, that unless you really kind of plan your schedule and you're regimented about it, you can't really do everything you need to do. So, but that also has made me, as I said, more efficient in, in what I do. I find that sometimes if you just have, if you don't have, a, you don't put deadlines on your calendar for yourself about how much time you want to take to do something, then it kind of leads into this, you know, maybe procrastination mode where you feel like you have so much time that then, mm -hmm. then you end up not finishing it, right? So, yeah, it does require discipline to to cut off, you know, and things that are important. And, and I think that for me, um, being organized and having a schedule that is organized ahead of time also removes the anxiety of having to think about too many mm -hmm. things at once because I already figured out how all is going to work out, right? So that alone gives me a peace of mind, like, okay, I'm going into the day or week or month with everything already planned out. And of course things happen, right? And, and you have to just be open to um, being, you have to be flexible, but that is something that I don't have to think about anymore because I already planned it. So, mm -hmm. but I'm a planner and I know different, you know, different people are operating differently. So, yeah, I'm a planner too. So <laughs> I totally feel you on that. Uh, I was going to say, you know, the question here is kind of what some foundational skills are for, you know, geoscientists. Um, you know, we've talked a little bit about self-discipline. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add as far as, you know, a skill set that's been really valuable for you in your career? Yeah, I would say critical thinking is always been, you know, transferable to a lot of different things I do. Um, and then actually, well, in, in my case, you know, really being able to uh, to know how to do things in the lab, specifically to my science. And I think that especially for students, that is really important to make sure that if they decide to do to be ex become expert in, in a specific subdiscipline, make sure that they really know all of the steps and learn the skills required to really kind of take the experiment from A to B to C to the end, right? Instead of just maybe uh, cutting corners or just having other people involved in that process. Mm -hmm. I think um, it's, yeah, learning all the steps, it's a, it's a fundamental skill that then you can use later on for teaching and learning, you know, transferring those, those skills to, to other people but also becoming a real expert. So I would say that is, you know, um, skills, again, in the lab, in the field, uh, just learn how to actually do things from, from the beginning to the end. It's, it's a valuable, you know, it's very valuable. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a great tip because, you know, you see people who are a little bit farther along in their careers, they're mostly advising students or, or managing teams, um, and you don't see them out out in the field doing their work or in the lab doing their work, but it's always really great when they have that deep level mm -hmm. of understanding. Um, and it makes you trust them as a student or an employee that they could come in there and they could do the science with you. Yeah, absolutely. And really know what they're doing. So yeah. I think that's a, that's a great tip there. Um, okay, so you know, here's kind of a fun question. For you, would you consider success and fulfillment interchangeable? Um, and, and how would you define those sort of in the context of your experiences? I don't consider them interchangeable necessarily, but they're definitely related. So for me, fulfillment is anything that I do that kind of makes me uh, feel like I've accomplished something and I've done it well. And then I, I am fulfilled. And that can be small things or big things, right? And then eventually if you 
if you keep doing things that way and you keep being fulfilled, that will eventually lead to success, but it's not necessarily the same. Um, and success eventually is just the final product of, of, of that process of small fulfillments uh, and then recognition and, and, you know, publishing maybe a cool paper or being funded and all that, teaching mm -hmm. students, graduating students, that's you know, all part of success. So do you feel like success is a little bit more of an external marker for you and fulfillment is more internal? Um, it can, yeah. Probably if you have to, you know, divide them up. Yeah. Uh, success has to be measured somehow, right? And so mm -hmm. the measure has to come somehow from outside. Okay, cool. But you can also feel successful, you know, inside necessarily without necessarily having a, uh, you know, a recognition. But I think that it does eventually lead to an outside, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. mark. Yeah. So um, I think this is an interesting question here too. Um, you know, you're you're obviously a teacher fundamentally. You spend a lot of time advising students, teaching classes. I know you said you're department head now. So, um, what creative ways do you transfer knowledge to students and enter the broader geoscience community? I always like to bring my own experience into the classroom. Um, then that can be either field experience or lab experience or an experiment that um, started, that went wrong or an idea that I thought was great and didn't work out. Um, whatever it is, just, I, I try to like to make it personal, somehow to add some personal touch to anything that I do because that connects you with the students uh, more. Um, and it's easier, obviously later I found that it was easier for me to do it later in my career because obviously I had more experience, right? And I had more examples that I could use at the beginning. You're like a little intimidating <laughs> because you kind of go from being a student to being a teacher, right? With no really transition, uh, not much. Um, but yeah, that's how, that's what I do. I always try to kind of give some, uh, some examples that are, you know, real life examples when I can. Cool. Do you think, you know, or how, how would you think that we can improve our outreach efforts to the broader community, to the world, you know, as we try and teach geoscience to people who aren't necessarily geoscience students? Yeah, I think by making geosciences more relevant and really breaking it down to the public so that they understand that everything we do has direct impact on their life, you know, from the future of natural resources to climate change, right? It's all rooted in geosciences, but most people don't know what geosciences is. Um, and so I find myself on a almost weekly, if not daily basis, when I talk with either friends or acquaintances, really explaining why what we do as geoscientists is important, right? And and I, you really have to scale it down and, and get out of your own you know, we tend to sometimes when we do research in a specific area to be very focused and, and maybe not, you know, not, not broad enough, right? For, for like a, an individual who is not a scientist, for example, to understand. So you really have to kind of step out of it. But even the concept of time and processes and physical processes on Earth, for example, that we can now see on Mars, you know, all these things, they just don't, are not used to hearing them or they are not used to having someone explain to them that that is all part of geosciences. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that is part of the problem of why geosciences still to this date is not as recognized as other sciences, sciences as biology, for example, biology, right? That it's, it's taught at school uh, and kids know it from early on. And so they understand that the impact and, and um, importance of it, geosciences is still very much like a black box for most people, they just don't know. So I think every chance we have to really connect with the community, uh, it's important. And we just have to, we have to, again, be, um, do it and, and in, a, in a, we have to be intentional. Great. Okay, so um, another question here for you. Um, that's kind of an interesting question, sort of along the lines of the future of geoscience and the future of um, SSS society. Um, 
what impacts have you seen that geoscience research, geoscience practices have had to um, ensure human sustainability? And do you have any suggestions or thoughts on, um, you know, resources that we should be capitalizing on to, you know, push towards sustainability? Because we're not we're not quite there yet, right? So yeah, um, yeah. I think that as as I said, you know, being making sure that we do um, always push ourselves to think about what are the broader impacts of our science, which I think NSF has done a really great job of, at at pushing everybody, forcing everybody really to think about that because <laughs> you have yeah. to have it in your proposal and now it's not just like a paragraph that you can just, mm -hmm. you know, make up. You have to really think about it. And I think that this has really pushed everybody to think more broadly about, okay, what is that I can do at the local level or maybe, you know, community level to really help society um, translate what we do and make it impactful or just, you know, highlight what are the, the what is the impact of our science um, for the broader community and then really connecting with other sciences which we already do but for example planetary uh, exploration right now it's at the forefront of science um, and geoscience that uh, because everything we see on other planets in terms of what, what we're trying to understand in terms of processes on other planets come Um, and that has to be, again, I think that's one of the future of geosciences and something that we can definitely um, benefit from, but also provide the community um, uh, and other fields like astronomy and planetary um, geoscience as yeah, is something that it's it's something that we can definitely expand on. Um, the other thing is, again, as I said, some of the most ch the, the greatest challenges of our time are uh, is our climate change and, and natural resources, and, and geoscientists again are uh, the ones who are directly involved in studying those problems and making strides to uh, to solve these issues. Uh, maybe not so much, and, and it can be in different ways, right? We don't all have to work on climate change, but even understanding what potentially is has been the effect of climate change and other processes in geological time definitely has an impact on understanding the future of climate change. So uh, there's a lot of different ways we can go about it um, that is not necessarily just applied, you know, science. Yeah, so I think you've touched on this a little bit, but, um, you know, the, the sort of changing landscape for geo geoscientists, geologists um, in the last decade or so, you know, has, has also lent itself to a change in job opportunities. Um, and, and so, you know, I think a lot of folks are seeing that there's potentially fewer job opportunities in geoscience than there used to be. So, you know, why would you suggest somebody go into geosciences or choose that as their career? I would actually argue that there are maybe fewer jobs in the classic geoscience jobs that, that we may think of, like oil and gas maybe, mm -hmm. um, but there are, there are more jobs in other fields that they're directly related that they, and where they need actually skills that geoscience students have. Like, for example, um, water resources, environmental um, uh, non-profit or governmental, uh, you know, institutions. I have to say that most of our students, well, all of the ones that I've been in touch with that have graduated from our program um, have found jobs in a variety of, of disciplines. And they're not necessarily like disciplines that have nothing to do with geosciences. They all have connections with geosciences. So I think that because geosciences is, became, is becoming broader and is not as focused as, you know, it's not just geology, uh, uh, that has, you know, opened a variety of, of opportunities to our students. Yeah, so I, I thought your comment there was interesting that geoscience is broadening as a discipline rather than just being purely mm -hmm. geology. And I think, I think you're absolutely right. You know, one of the things that people see is fewer jobs in classic, in classic geology um, sort of sub-disciplines or, or fields. And I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to how we as early career professionals or students can make sure that we're getting the training and the experiences 
to be broader geoscientists, you know, right? To be to be able to work in all of these different areas that aren't the classic geology jobs. Yeah, my advice would be to still have a solid core of of geoscience so that you actually know the fundamentals, but then broaden, you know, and take advantage of, of classes that are outside of the classic geoscience classes. And it could be policy, it could be um, you know law it could be um i draw sometimes i hydrology is together in, in in some places is together with geosciences in our places different department but so kind of broaden your your expertise outside of, of the classic core but i think it's important to have a a, a solid understanding uh, of geoscience so that you can then um branch out um so a lot of the jobs that our students or at least the the local companies that are seeking to employ students here in arizona um what they always ask for for example is um field expertise is so very much a relevant <laughs> a skill that many companies look for uh in dep independently from you know whether or not they're environmental or more like energy resources or water um they definitely need people who know how to operate in the field um and that can be as basic as being able to actually do field work you know outside and be comfortable and not everybody is as to do that and and is comfortable doing that but that's definitely something that if you're comfortable doing and you have the opportunity to have experience uh doing field work just take that you know and and use that uh, opportunity uh and then and the lab skills are equally important right so actually having um, being able to show that you can actually, as I was saying before, that you can actually do things, experiments, carrying them out from A to B to C, write a report about that, you know, and then being able to interpret data and finish the, your product with, a, with, you know, a publication or whatever, whatever that might look like. Um, those are all very important skills. Computational skills is another very important thing that now um, our students uh, have the opportunity to to have that we didn't I didn't really have when I was a student, for example. Um, so you know, MATLAB, Python, absolutely. If you if you can take classes in those uh, fields, uh, do it because they're they're incredibly important. RGIS is another one that is like translates in so many different jobs. So those are like more computational type skills. But so if you can combine both, uh, th then you're golden. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, do you think that there are areas of geoscience um, that are that are the word here in the question is is undermined, but I guess, you know, areas of geoscience that are under recognized as being really valuable to society or or having really great, um, you know, career options for, for students and early career professionals? Yeah, one of them that I just mentioned before that I think it's definitely going to um, expand in the future is geoplanetary. So mm -hmm. geoscience is applied to other planets. It's something that we need more of right now. I do see a lot of a lot of that science being driven not necessarily by geoscientists, and I'd like to see more of the geoscientists driving the science on other planets. <laughs> that's mm -hmm. like what I would like to see, and that's something that you know, it, it, there's a lot, there are a lot of opportunities and a lot of uh, open questions, right, and and things that we need to do. Um, and then in terms of again um, making sure that geosciences takes a, a a role that is like a driving role into the issue of climate change is it's very important as well because i think that a lot of the science that that is part of uh of mitigation eventually and, and finding solutions come is rooted into geosciences cool um so uh, you know a question here you're you're in academia i'm in industry um and there's definitely in, in a lot of cases, there's sort of a gap between our experiences, um, between the type of questions we we ask and we and we work on. So I'm wondering if you have any ideas on how we can better bridge the gap between academia and industry. Yeah, I think that uh, what I I like to do uh, here at the University of Arizona is to really connect with industry by providing 
well, by talking with industry, um, the stakeholders in industry and asking them what their needs are and what they would like to see from um, our students, you know, what are the skills that they value, making sure that we actually do provide those skills to our students so that they're employable, and then create scholarships or internships, um, and scholarships too, <laughs> uh, through their support, but internships with them so that the students can actually have experience with industry throughout their career and they can then decide where they want to go. Um, and so it's very much a conversation that I've had with a lot of different kinds of industry um, that has been very valuable because you learn a lot about what is what are the needs, right, in industry that we are often not, as academics, we're not thinking about. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And I think it's very important to solve. And the trends, right, and also try to, to be ahead of time and, and try to plan for the future directions. It's like, well, how is, you know, what are we going to need in, in in 10 years, what is going to be the, you know, are we going to see a decline in certain jobs or skills or an increase in certain jobs that require the skills that we can give to students while we're not doing? So things like that. I think that just having a conversation with industry and make them part of um, the enterprise, you know, like through, for example, being part of the advisory board, you know, I make sure that my advisory board is off from industry so that we end from different kinds of industries so that I have a broad idea on what the needs are. Great. It's important. Yeah. Yeah. So you you kind of mentioned about this idea of staying on top of the trends, trying to predict the future a little bit, right? To see where things are going. Mm -hmm. So um, the last question I have for you is um, you know, what are you excited to work on in the next, you know, 10 years, 20 years? You know, you're a mid-career, um, you know, scientist, so you've got you've got tons of space to, to go forward, right? So what are you excited yeah. to do? Well, there's two things. One is geoplanetary, which I have no experience in, and so that will be new, and it will be taking me some time, but I have some ideas, and I'll definitely like to explore that. Uh, and then... Um, really the record of climate on geological time scales and how mm -hmm. actually that has been recorded, you know, in the set, in specifically in the sedimentary record, which is something that I've dabbled in a little bit, but mm -hmm. I'm going in more from a, you know, um, also bio point of view with colleagues or paleontologists and really looking at the, the you know, the old uh, interaction between the biology, the biology and the physical, the bi biological world and the physical world together. Um, that has been something that has, has fascinated me for a long time and I just, it's going to take me a long time to really learn and, and be maybe an expert in, I may never be, but it's something that I really am passionate about. I love that. I love that you're like, you know, you're in the middle of your career and you're like, I'm going to take a totally new direction. I'm going to learn something completely new and explore that. I think that's great. I think that clearly sort of ties back to your your early points of what's made you successful school and willing to be flexible and, and sort of take new challenges on. So, um, so thank you so much. This has been awesome. Thank you. This was really fun. Yeah, I've, I've really enjoyed getting to know you a little bit. And, uh, and I guess that can be the end of our official interview. <laughs>